Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you very much for coming. This morning, we're very pleased to have Allie Danes from the University of Washington coming to speak to us on computing tables of elliptic curves over Q, Q squared phi. Hi. Um, I'm Ali Dynas, and you might notice that this is joint work with quite a few other people. So this project has actually originated from several other projects. Um, it started, oh, almost two years ago um, with just trying to implement some of Dembele's algorithms for just computing um, Hilbert modular forms over Q joint square root of five. Um, and it started out also with um, Joanna Gasky, part of her master's thesis was on um, computing some initial tables in a sine Watkins manner. And then it really got going last summer when there was an REI, or sorry, an REU at the University of Washington. Um, and that's where Jonathan Bober, um, Araya, Ben, Andrew, Ashwath, and Paul came in. And then this work has been continued this summer at uh, um, the MRC Summer School in Snowbird, Utah. And that was Jonathan Bover, um, Eric Schneider, Christelle Vincent, William Stein, and myself. And of course, William Stein's been involved in all, all of this. OK, so first I'm going to give you some motivation. And then we're going to go through the tables, how we got the elliptic curves from the Hilbert modular forms, finally, how we got the modular forms, and then um, future work, or where it's going from there. OK, so recently, well, the first one's not exactly recent, but recently, there's been a lot of work for elliptic curves over Q. Um, starting many years ago, there were the Antwerp tables. And this is where they went about and systematically computed all elliptic curves up to conductor 200. And then they also looked at curves that had bad reduction um, only at 2 and 3. For the past 20 plus years, Cremona has been doing his tables um, going through elliptic curves by conductor. And so this is computing tables of curves up to isomorphism? Or? Yes. So he's been finding um, all the curves in that, or all the isogeny classes of curves and all the curves in each isogeny class. And then he's also been computing um, many other invariants or invariants associated to these curves as well, um, like the rank, um, Shaw, um, the torsion, um, these things, modular degree. And um, he recently, as of the summer, verified the rank four curve. Um, it is indeed the one that everyone thought was the first rank four curve is indeed the first rank four curve. And on his website, he says that he's currently um, up to conductor 250,000. Then if you go about this in kind of an orthogonal manner, you can look at the stein watkins tables. And in these, if you write the elliptic curve um, in its short wire stress form versus the minimal wire stress form, so y squared equals x cubed uh, plus ax plus b, then you can iterate over the a and b in um, a bit more intelligent way than the naive way and just throw out all the curves where the conductor is too large. And you can get huge tables of curves with smallish coefficients. And then um, even more recently, there are the Stein-Miller tables. And they verify the full burton swinerton dyer conje conjecture up to curves um, with conductor less than or equal to 5,000 for all but, I think, 11 curves. Um, recently, there also been some big theorems on the elliptic curve side. So there's been Weil's theorem. Who hasn't heard of that? Um, all elliptic curves over Q are modular. Then there have also been theorems um, by Rosagi or Kalivagen and other people that give us uh, the BSG rank conjecture for curves where you have the order of the L function at 1 is less than or equal to 1. So we have the, rank or, so we have the BSG rank conjecture for curves of rank 0 or 1. And then there's been Mazur, who's classified isogenies and torsion. So we know how big isogeny groups or isogenies can get and the torsion. And then 
there's also been classification of the CM curves. So out of all the number fields in the world, why Q joins square root 5? <laughs> well, first, let's look at the number fields that would maybe have analog or similar theorems as in the previous slide and see what we would want. Um, well, we would want a generalization of modular forms that hopefully would also have modularity. So that means we're going to be looking at Hilbert modular forms. And to look at Hilbert modular forms, you need to restrict to totally real number fields. Um, along with the Hilbert modular forms, what we also get are parameterization by Schirmer curves, uh, Higner points, and Euler systems. And a lot of these are the ingredients for BSD as well. So we have modularity conjectures and um, BSD conjectures for curves over totally real number fields. And more specifically, why Q joins square root 5? Why not just any totally real number field? First, if you order by the discriminant, it's the first uh, totally real number field that comes after Q. Um, and just so you know, if we're going to let um, phi be 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 just to fix a generator. And then the ring of integers is actually z adjoint phi. And then uh, other important things about this field is it has um, the ring of integers in this field has class number 1 which computationally makes it much easier to work with. Um, things that make it maybe more interesting than other class number one quadratic fields um, is we have an infinite cyclic unit group versus just plus or minus one is with Q. And so this has come, this has raised questions with how do we order things? Um, how do we describe like the minimal wire stress equation since we have this ambiguity of units? Um, it also has uh, the most J or the most CMJ invariants of um, any totally real quadratic field. Q has 13, um, F has 31, and um, all the other quadratic or totally real quadratic fields will have fewer than this. And then also the modular curve x naught of 17 has rank 1 over F. And so this gets us actually infinitely many isogenies of degree 17 over F. So that's why. And some interesting computations have also already been done um, with other number fields, including Q joint square 5. So Pinch has tables of, with the of elliptic curves with bounded reduction. Um, Donnelly Boyd, who are two of the pioneers in computing Hilbert modular forms, have tables of Hilbert modular new forms. And they also have many, many curves. Um, then there's our now tables. So here we're going to assume modularity. And then we get chromonotype tables. Um, of elliptic curves up to conduct, norm of conductor um, 1831, which is the first rank 2 curve. And then um, we also have the classification of the CM curves. For the theory, Zhang has done a lot to um, generalize the work of um, Gross and Higner and Kalabagen. So under some mild hypotheses, we actually have a similar um, theorem for the rank conjecture uh, for many curves with um, rank less than or equal to 1. And then, unfortunately, not for Q joint square root of 5, but for many other totally real fields, we do have modularity. Um, my advisor has talked to Taylor a bit about this, and unfortunately, Q joint square root of 5 is going to be one of the harder fields to prove modularity for. But right now, a lot has been done towards proving it on a number field by number field basis. OK, and now let's get to um, the CM elliptic curves. So the theorem is that this field has 31 distinct Q bar isomorphism classes of CM elliptic curves, and it's more than any other field. And if we just let H sub D be the minimal polynomial of the J invariant, then we have this table. Um, and we can look at the D so, such that the curve has CM by that order. And if we look, Q joint square root 5 is in red. And just looking at this, it has many others. And if we continue past square root of 22, these continue for um, most of the ones that follow to continue to just have one. So. So sorry to interrupt you, but I think that many people in this room, including myself, are used to thinking about imaginary quadratic fields when we're talking about CMJ invariants, where you're thinking about the Hilbert class field of K, where K is an imaginary quadratic field. Mm -hmm. And we know that the J invariants that are, um, are J invariants of the elliptic 
to curb, you know, they generate the lower class field. Mm -hmm. So what's the analogous situation here for real quadratic fields? Like what's going on here? Where's the elliptic curve coming from? And how's it connected to the modular form? So elliptic curves over C that have CM, they're defined over a number field. And that number field is the imaginary, is the Hilbert class field of the imaginary quadratic field. So right. where's, where's, the real, where's the real quadratic field coming in? So I think we're looking at this as we're using the real quadratic field instead of Q. And then we're looking at extensions of this. So the curves are defined over the real quadratic field? And they have their J invariant in the field itself? Yes. OK, and so now we'll get up to the tables. And first, I can just show you the actual tables that we had. And They basically look like Cremona's book, except here we have phi because they're over Q joint square root of 5. And we have similar invariants. And we just have tables and tables and tables. Um, one thing to note is that here you see um, say 1516A uh, and 1516B. This indicates that, um, so the 1516 is actually the norm of the conductor. And this just says that it factors. And so we ha actually have two ideals of this given norm. And so we've just labeled one A and one B. And then also, and so we just have huge tables all the way up to um, conductor norm. Oh, sorry, over. Um, 1831. But one quick remark is that if we're letting phi send square root of 5 to negative square root of 5, then that means that our tables have E, and they both also have, sorry, they, also, they have E, and they also have sigma of E. And so this is a bit of a redundancy, but we found it was much easier to keep track of things, and it actually caused less confusion long term if we just had everything. And so our end tables include both. And if you wanted to see the tables yourself or any of the code, we actually have a GitHub um, account. And this is where we've been keeping all the code to where you could just download this yourself and play with it using Sage. And you can also just look at any of the tables that we generated. Um, they're all here um, on this GitHub. So do you generalize this Stein-Watkins approach of just going through small coefficients in Q square of 5? Not yet. That's actually on our to-do list. How do you list? Um, for the Stein Watkins or for this? For the, for the how, how do we generate the curves? Yeah. Um, many, many different ways, and I'll get to that okay. right after the tables. So we did start um, with kind of a naive Stein Watkins approach, just try and get some, but that would take. So you can create an effective algorithm, but it would be very, very slow. And here, for all of this, we're assuming modularity, but that would be very slow. And so then we came up with. Um, or used other people's um, more intelligent methods to cut down on our search space or to get out the curves more directly. And so we ended up using five or six different methods to actually go through and find the table. Um, one of the nice things is since we had the Hilbert modular forms, we and were assuming modularity, we could go through and we could see basically which ones we were missing. And once we had one curve um, in the isogeny class, then there's a method that we can use that will just go and iterate through and get all the other isogenous curves. And so the bulk of the work was figuring out how to get all these curves, because there are some cases where we did all this work, and then we could still, still see that some were missing, um, assuming modularity. What's Stein Watkins? Um, Stein Watkins is another database um, that's kind of orthogonal to the Cremona database. 
in that as opposed to iterating through the curves by conductor and using modularity to make sure you get all the curves of a given conductor, what it does is it just takes curves of the form um, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b and intelligently iterates through the a and b so where and only keeps the ones with um, conductor under a given bound, which is about like 10 to the 7. So it gets many more curves, but not in as nice a manner, and there are gaps. Yeah. Um, the problem is that you can have uh, curves with small conductor, but huge coefficients. Yeah. Okay. So. And that is kind of work that's been shelved, but hopefully we'll get it brought out again for um, the Q-score root 5 case. OK, so here are just some curve counts. Uh, so if we look at, um, so we have the rank, the number of isogenies, the, another, the number of um, isomorphism um, classes, and then the smallest norm, uh, smallest um, conductor, or norm of conductor. And so for rank zero, um, and this is in our tables, uh, we have 745, and then we have uh, 2,174 isomorphism classes, and the smallest one is 31. So our tables start at conductor norm 31. And then what this says is then the first rank two curve is at 199, or sorry, the first rank one curve is at 299, and we went up to the very first rank two curve. Um, Right. Right. So here, I'm not willing to make a conjecture just because we haven't gone very high. But it would be interesting to see what would happen if we had more curves. And here are the current rank records. Um, these are the smallowing, or these, the following are the smallest known curves of given ranks and the people who found them. Um, and the equations are listed based on the A invariants. And so for the first three, these were all found by Dembele um, and confirmed by our tables. And one of our goals and what we're working on right now is to confirm the rank three and the rank four curve. Uh, what's kind of interesting is that the rank three curve is actually over Q. And um, it would be interesting to see if we could also find a smaller rank three curve that has, that's actually a prime versus something that's composite. And here are the number of isogeny classes of a given size. And what's inter interesting about this table is that 10 occurs. Over Q, the largest known isogeny class is 8. And then we can also look at the isogeny degrees. And again, there are going to be more. Um, like 17 does not occur in the table. But um, these are the counts that we have so far. And then we can also look at the torsion subgroups. And again, what's interesting is we get another torsion subgroup that doesn't occur over Q. And um, moreover, this torsion, or there's only one curve over Q adjoint square root of 5 that will even have this torsion subgroup. Okay, now we'll get on to what I think is the interesting part, which is actually finding these curves. Um, so the strategies, well, we're going to assume modularity, which I keep saying, because we're assuming it. And then we're also going to assume that we can quickly compute um, the A sub P's associated to um, the Hilbert modular forms. So I think this is the part that you should explain. Can you explain, like, given an elliptic curve, how to attach a modular form to it? Form? Okay, so um, what we consider an elliptic curve attached to a Hilbert modular form is if they have the same L series, which um, when you write out the L series, basically we're assuming that they're going to have the same coefficients in the L series. 
So we're assuming that the A sub Fs that we have that are the coefficients for the Hilbert modular form, and which also occur in the L series, are actually going to be um, the A sub E's that would occur in the L series, and that are going to be related to the number of points these elliptic curves have over the finite fields. So basically, if you take the analog of the um, L function, I mean, if you just take it and define it, like you could even write it down for everybody, it's the product of you know, one over one right. over Um, oh, this is over Q. How does this change? Um, we have an extra term over a number field, I think. And so if you compute this as a sum, then if you look at this, then you're going to get um, and these are going to be norms. Depends on the elliptic curve there, right? Right. Nothing depends on the elliptic curve. Right. So we need something to do with the point counts. Um, um, the sum formula in terms of elliptic curves is you have these over n to the s where if you look at E over the finite field um, FP, then this is going to be norm of P um, plus 1 minus, I think this is the relationship we have. But what we're saying is that the relationship with these is these are actually at the good primes, at the primes that don't divide conductor, these are going to be equal. Where AP of F is? Are the coefficients of the Hilbert modular form. So they have integer coefficients? Right, these will. Um, so we're only looking at rational cuspal new forms. If it didn't have integer coefficients, then the Hilbert modular form would actually correspond to an abelian variety. Um, and the dimension of that abelian variety would be the dimension of um, or would be the degree of uh, the, this generated by all the A sub P's of this field. And so one of the things we are interested in doing is reworking a lot of those four billion varieties because we can compute these full spaces of Hilbert modular forms. So. So if this is just the integers, then, then f corresponds to an elliptic curve. Um, if it's larger, then f corresponds to an abelian variety. Okay, so we can do a naive enumeration. And this is an algorithm that Cremona says, quote, is not respectable. But what's going on here is, let's say we fix a conductor, then we can compute all the um, coefficients of the Hilbert module, of the rational, rational new forms um, of this conductor up to a large bound, where B is maybe five or 10 just large enough to where we can distinguish each of the modular forms from each other. Um, so we can uniquely determine them. And then we can systematically enumerate all the elliptic curves um, just in the short wire stress form and compute exactly these um, uh, A sub P of E's just by counting the points over finite fields. And if we find a match, we can compute the conductor. And if the conductor matches with the forms we're looking at, then we're good to go. Otherwise, we just continue. And since the elliptic curves are countable, this will terminate and it will work. However, it's stupid. It's going to be ridiculously slow and you shouldn't do it. But it says that what we're doing in general is reasonable. 
And what makes computations interesting is not the fact that you have an algorithm. It's that it's either fast or if you could come up with one that would not depend on modularity. That would also be very interesting. Um, you're going to be enumerating over many, many, many curves. And just because they have small coefficients doesn't mean they're going to have a small conductor. I mean, there is a bit of a relationship there, but not enough to give us any particular speed. And so it's just slow because you're going to just be going through every single curve and doing this at every single step. So, but in step one, I mean, what are you doing? It just looks like you're going through ideals in a number field uh, Q-score of five and writing down norms of them. And then what do you do? How do you compute AP oh. of F? I mean, the way you've defined it here, it comes from the elliptic curve. Oh, the AP of F, right now I'm assuming we can compute that. In my last bit, we're going to go through Dembele's algorithm and actually talk about um, computing the spaces of Hilbert modular forms. Meaning like, I mean, like the Stein approach where you're creating a basis for forms and then just taking combinations of the basis or what, like, right. so you can compute all up to a large bound. Um, so what we get from Dembele's algorithm is we get a vector space of the modular forms and we also get the action of the HECA operators on them. So we can go through and you can cut down to the dimension one subspaces and from the dimension one subspaces then you can just keep hitting it with HECA operators and from this reading off the coefficients for um, all the primes of good reduction. So we're not working with the pads of primes of bad reduction. But if we want to be able to get those, then we can compute enough um, a sub p's of f at the primes of good reduction. And then we can use um, Dockchitzer's um, L function uh, um, code to actually use the functional equation to rework what we must have had at the primes of bad reduction. way to test whether two curves with, the, with forms of A, B are exogenous? Um, like if you do the A variant and do the lowest terms and compare? Um, the quick and dirty check that, so I think there is just is isogenous that works over number fields in SAGE. Um, you could also just compute enough of these, and then there are bounds where you know that they have to be isogenous if you get up to those bounds. But those are pretty large, I think, still. Um, and then I think there are also algorithms for computing just isogenies between two curves. So given two curves, it will just compute isogenies. Uh, you have to over Q. Um, we have a trick to get around this uh, that's actually from a 2011 paper. So we don't e need Mazur's theorem. So we are able to get around that and compute everything in the isogeny degree or in the isogeny class. Okay, so here is a slightly smarter way. So again, we're assuming that we can compute um, the A sub P's from the Hilbert modular forms. And if you just pick one Hilbert modular form and compute several A sub P's, then what you can do is you can find, you can go backwards and you can find all the elliptic curves over these finite fields that have to have those A sub P's. And so you just do this for each prime and then find, and so you have a curve for each prime and then you can just use Chinese remainder theorem and lift the coefficients. And you can find a curve that has, um, exactly these a sub p's at those particular primes. And then you can compute the conductor, see if it matches, and if not, use more p's. Ali, I think it would help if you could clarify what your goal is. Are you starting with an elliptic curve and trying to create modular no. forms? No, 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 no. What we have, to so we have um, the space of modular forms, of cuspidal rational new forms. Um, so we have uh, the space. So these are cuspidal <coughs> So you have, for example, a basis of this 
Yes. Yes. We have a basis of this space, and we can compute as many a sub p's for each element that we want. By just take, writing it as a combination of basis elements and figuring out what the, what the a sub p's are for your thing, or, or, for, or some other method? Um, so we have this entire space, and we can hit it with the heck operators. Uh, to break, to decompose it into the different a sub p that we, you would have at that prime. And then you can continually do this until you get down and find all the dimension one subspaces. And these are the ones that are going to correspond to the elliptic curves. And so then you just keep hitting it with the heck operators and so that you can compute um, what the a sub p's for larger and larger primes. Okay, so you start with this. And yes. What's our goal is a Cremona type table of elliptic curves over Q adjoint screw, screw root of 5. So we want a table of elliptic curves um, ordered by conductor. But associated to a modular As, form. Right, associated to a modular form. Because we're assuming modularity, so we're only going to get curves that are associated to modular forms. So, so can you explain again your scheme? So you search. So in the first step, you search curves over which field? Um, so everything is done over Q join the square root of 5. Okay. And so for the sieve, we would still start. We're assuming we have, we'd pick one rational new form. And we'd compute um, a lot of its a sub p up for up to a high bound of p. And then from this, then we can go and we can find each elliptic curve, or we can find an elliptic curve over f sub p for each a sub p. And so then we're going to get a list of elliptic curves for each p that have this um, uh, a sub p. Okay. And the lift of f u squared root 5 is in the PRP. Right, and then we're lifting um, to curves over q joint square root of 5. Okay. Any other questions? Right, so n um, is going to be an ideal in the ring of integers of q adjoint square root 5. And phi is 1 plus the square root of 5 divided by 2. And so this is, if we're trying to find elliptic curves of a given conductor n, this is one method to find them. But again, this is still relatively naive, and it has a similar drawback to the even more naive method. But it did actually work fairly well, and it did generate a lot of the curves in the table. Um, so if we want um, a method that goes along with the naive method, but cuts down on the search space quite a bit, then what we, can, what we do is we realize that we have a complete list of the torsion family, or of the torsion that's going to appear over the field Q join the square root of 5. Um, and this is, so, um, the kamiani nashman theorem, and it also tells us that there is a unique elliptic curve with 15 torsion. And the theorem that we used in our paper to make this an algorithm is we're going to let P, or L be a prime and E an elliptic curve over Q joint square root of 5. And then if you, L divides um, the order of torsion of an isogenous curve E prime, where E prime is isogenous to E, um, then this happens if and only if um, it divides um, uh, the order of E over these finite fields for which P has good reduction. And this means if we uh, are looking for a curve of conductor N, um, then we can restrict to torsion families. So we would use the same method as the naive method 
but there are processes where you can enumerate just over the torsion families, and this cuts down greatly on the search space. And um, this one, uh, Tom Fisher has um, explicit families, so that once you know E prime, then you can find other curves that have um, the same um, uh, structure at a given prime L over Q joint square root of five. So once you know one, you can just iterate through and find the others. Okay, and then there's also twisting. So if you have a curve that has conductor N, and then if you pick D in the ring of integers, so in the ring of integers of F, um, that's square free and co-prime to N, then you can just twist. And so what we can do is, if we want all curves up to a certain bound, then we just pick all these Ds and we just twist by D over and over again and see what curves we get. And so this is pretty much the order that we went through as well this summer. And so at each time, for each algorithm, it hasn't found all the curves yet. Some of them, if we just let them run for quite a while, they would. But we keep coming up with new to find the gaps in our tables because we are, because since we have all the Hilbert or all the um, cuspal rational um, new forms, we know exactly where we're missing curves. And so we can find more um, directed methods to try and find those. So the next method is um, we can just look at elliptic curves with good reduction outside um, a set S of primes. So let's say you're missing a curve of conductor N, then uh, you can just use magma. <laughs> Um, or Magma's implementation of um, Cremona and Lingham and just find all the curves with good reduction outside that set. So the set S um, will just have all the primes that divide the conductor, but when you find all these elliptic curves, you could find thousands. And they will have all different conductors, just you're guaranteed that the primes divide their conductor, or you can guarantee that their conductor only consists of a certain set of primes. Um, and then finally, we use an algorithm of Dembélé. So right now, we haven't done anything that's analogous to what Cremona did, where he was able to use um, his modular symbols to look at special values of L functions to create the period lattice, and then go back from there to actually find the um, elliptic curves from the modular forms. So he had just an effective algorithm where you plug in a modular form, and you can get out the elliptic curve. Uh, we really don't have anything like that here because we don't have modular symbols. So something that looks on the surface very close and that's trying to um, mimic this is an algorithm due to Dembélé where he takes um, special values of L functions and special values of twists of L functions um, to guess the period lattice or to guess the periods of the elliptic curve. And so you get several guesses at the period. And then you can work back where from that, knowing what um, the conductor is, you have a very good guess at what the discriminant should be, um, because you know all the primes that have to divide this discriminant. And you can work backwards from that and um, get, in every case that we tried the elliptic curve. And this was what was able to find the last few curves that the former methods were unable to. So using all of these different methods together, we were able to come up with a table of elliptic curves um, that over Q joint square root of five that are analogous to Cremona's table. And this one is very slow. This is why we didn't just use it straight off the bat. And it requires um, thousands and thousands of A sub P's. Okay, and then we were also able to, once we had one curve in the isogeny, we were able to compute the rest of the isogeny class. So as was, state, or was noticed earlier, um, in Cremona's tables for Q, um, you're using Bailey's formulas that allow us to enumerate all P isogenies, but to know when to stop, we had to use Mazur's, form, or Mazur's um, bound. And over Q, the problem is there's a theorem that says there is a bound, but it's not um, an effective theorem. It doesn't give an algorithm to compute this, and so it's unknown what it is. But using recent work um, of Bellaray, 
we can actually compute a superset S of the prime degrees of the isogenies. And from that, we are able to um, use Baylor's formulas without having to know um, a priori a bound like we did with Q. So the end result, we were able to compute all of these. OK, and now to computing the Hilbert modular forms. Um, this is the algorithm that's straight from Lucina Dembele's thesis. Uh, it generalizes um, the method over Q using Brandt matrices, but it has a nice speed up where instead of computing the right ideal classes, uh, you're actually computing um, just P1 of the ring of integers mod n. So where does this piece fit into what you were saying your goal was? So this is computing this in the first place. To compute the basis for that. Mm -hmm. So we're computing the C vector space here. And we're also computing um, heck operators, and we know what the action is then. So I think this is maybe backwards from how I should have presented this to you. Maybe like exactly backwards. <laughs> Par for the course for math talk. <laughs> OK, so for Dembele's algorithm, um, again, we're just working over Q join the square root of 5. Though his algorithm does generalize to other um, quadratic, totally real number fields. And I'd like to say he can generalize it to more than that, to number, totally real number fields with even degree. But I'm going to stop short. I'm going to claim that it does generalize, but I can't remember how much. So we're going to let B be the Hamiltonian um, quaternion algebra over F. So I squared equals negative 1, J squared ne equals negative 1 and ij equals negative um, jk, or sorry, ij equals negative ji um, equals k. And then we're going to let s be a very specific maximal order, um, where if you take the units of this, it's just going to be the octonians. Uh, and then we're going to use the Jackie Langlands correspondence, um, plus a little bit of work by Dembele, which says that the space of Hilbert modular forms of level n and weight 2, 2 is non canonically isomorphic as a HECA module um, to the C vector space, which is um, P1 of um, the finite ring um, O sub f mod n modded out by the action of the octonians. So if we're computing the C vector space, then we just view. Um, the P1s as column vectors. And since we've picked a quaternion al algebra that is only ramified at the infinite places, we know that it's split at all the primes dividing n. And this is for any n, because we picked one that ramifies at exactly the two infinite places. And so this induces a left action of the octonians on um, the P1s. And since we can just write out the 120 octonians, and we can write out the p1s, we can just compute this action and just mod out um, by s star. And this gives us our c vector space. The c vector space, which is the algebra? Exactly. Or sorry, no, this gives us a c vector space that's actually um, the Hilbert modular forms. Um, that's the heck operator T sub P. And so this action, so the space um, is non canonically isomorphic as a HECA module. So we still have the same action of the uh, HECA operators on those spaces. And what's the math that gives this isomorphism? How do you take a Hilbert modular form and turn it into a It's non-canonical. Um, so Dembele goes up and uses an idyllic map to go from one to the other. Um, so it's but nothing. You're not using no, it. You're no, not doing no. So we're only computing this one side, but it's enough to where from this we can get um, the a sub p's by using the action of the heck operators. So we don't really have anything as concrete as the Hilbert modular forms, but we have the information we need out of this.
And then uh, the last bullet is just saying that for P not dividing N, um, this is the action of the heck operator on these elements. Um, there are some speed issues that you need to worry about if you're going to uh, work with this. Um, what Dumble already did is instead of working with quaternion algebras, all we need to do is just change uh, the P1 of O sub F mod N. So instead of working with different Eichler orders, we can just change this. And this is very nice because um, if we want to compute as many A sub P's as we need, especially for um, his other algorithm for finding the curves from the twisted L functions, then we need thousands of these. So we need thousands of um, P1s for different Ns. So the main speed up is if we write N in terms of its prime powers, then what we can do is we can just break it apart in terms of each of these prime powers and just think and just compute um, P1 of O sub F mod uh, pi to the ei for each of these, and we can just save and store these. And so we can just recombine them as we need them for each of the ends and just compute them. And the other thing we're going to do is we're writing this in Cython to make this fast, but this is where we need to worry about um, machine size. So we just fix the, lar fix the largest size of the primes, or the prime powers, and of the number of prime factors we're going to allow. Because while well, we need a lot, if we just do this quick, if we just do this smartly, we can get as many as we need, um, and still have them small enough to do fast. And then the other speed up was just writing out and hard coding exactly what happens in each case of p when it's inert, split, and ramified, so that we can go back and do the two previous steps faster. And so these were the main speed ups that we used that really made this fast to compute the c vector spaces. Okay, now for future work, some of the future work we've already started on. At the MRC in June, um, we, and by we, I mean uh, John Bober, Cristal, Ari, um, Sebastian, William, and myself, started working on going up to rank three, trying to prove some of these rank bounds, conjecturally. And um, the first part is just speeding up our computation of the dimension one subspaces. So when we're trying to break apart the subspaces so that we can find the dimension one ones, what we're frequently left with, what we're always left with are very sparse uh, matrices. And so Sebastian and William spent a couple days and really sped up the sparse linear algebra to make the step, finding the dimension one subspaces and computing um, the A sub P's ridiculously fast. And then the current work that is still in progress is um, working on finding uh, the special values of the derivative of the L functions so that we can compute um, the ranks because we're just checking to see what the rank is in each case. And if it's too small, we just throw it away. We don't even need to compute it, but we're just checking um, those. And so now we have the formula and that is currently what needs to be implemented. So now we're getting these large tables of um, they sub P's, which we can then feed into the code once we have it for the L functions and we'll be able to find the ranks of all these curves without ever computing the curves. So you are assuming some sort of BSD here? Right, yes. Yes. Um, so we're assuming modularity and BSD here. And the future work, I think, has already all been touched upon. Um, so finish or really get going on the Stein Watkins type tables. And then also generalize this to modular abelian varieties, which would be the case where. Um, these aren't all rational. Thank you. Are there any questions? So I've already asked a lot of questions, so I'll give somebody else a chance. Uh, I decided the conductor grows. I haven't thought they had a number of curves you get out compare. I don't know. Um, let me see if we have anything along those lines.
I'm not sure. That's a good question. back to the receiving approach. Mm -hmm. So what makes it slow exactly? So you say that it may happen you have large coefficients, but you need to write the large coefficients anyway, even with another method. So if there are large coefficients, you need a lot of small prime p. And the, so what you saw is that you it, it gets hard to find a curve over fp with which the right number of points, right? Um, I think my slow is just slower than some of the other methods that we have. And so as the conductor was getting uh, larger, um, we were having to go through just more and more primes to find something that worked. Um, That right. What makes it slow is that the larger the prime is, the more hard it is to find a curve with the right number of points or something like that. How do you find Maybe. the curve with the right number of points? Do you take them at random or do you try to use flat polynomials to reduce to FP? Or? I think we might have been doing something as silly as taking them at random. So, right, so there might be ways to speed that up considerably. Any other questions?